Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our um, um, fourth uh, training activity that will be dedicated to robot and human motion planning in collaborative robotics. So here you have uh, an overview of the agenda of today. I give just a brief overview about ShareWork project, and then we will move to our uh, three uh, lectures, uh, the first one that will be given by Alessandro Umbrico, uh, the second one by Marco Faroni. Then we will have just a short uh, break for uh, a quick coffee, and we will move to our last presentation given by Julian Urain. Um, at the end of the session, uh, we will have a dedicated slot to question and answer. So just uh, uh, a few rules uh, to all of you. Um, whenever you have any question, you can just uh, uh, drop it in the uh, question and answer box that you have in the GoToMeeting tool. And at the end of each presentation, you will have also um, a quick questionnaire about the topics that have been explained uh, during the lecture and also um, a quality survey uh, that you have to answer in order to give us uh, your feedback. Um, at the end of this session, during the next few days, you will also get the recording of the session and uh, another questionnaire, and you are kindly uh, asked to uh, reply to it. It will be uh, really appreciated. Okay, as I said, here you have our speakers, uh, uh, myself, Simona Neri, I am the coordinator of Share Work Project, then Marco Faroni, that is a researcher at the CNR STEMA, Alessandro Umbrico, a researcher at IESTC CNR, and uh, um, Julian Ryan from uh, Technical University of Dartmouth. A brief overview of the project. Uh, Share Work Project is a four-year uh, project that received 7.3 million fundings, uh, and uh, the consortium is composed by 15 partners coming from uh, six different countries. But which is uh, the need and the goal of the project? Currently in the world, there are uh, 2 million robots, but just uh, 5,000 uh, units are dedicated to collaborative uh, tasks. Uh, thanks to the boost of the uh, industry 4.0 and 5.0, the uh, cobots market is expected to reach uh, 3.7 billion uh, by 2023, so really soon. So the objectives uh, uh, of Share Work Project are, first of all, to design the knowledge base and the semantic environment that is at, um, the fundamental part of uh, the project. And it has been already developed at the beginning um, during the first years of the project. Then uh, to develop a human-aware uh, dynamic uh, task planning and uh, um, an offline uh, real-time motion planner. Uh, the, the fourth one is to develop an, a multimodal human robot communication system and uh, to create and uh, define new methods to overcome all the limitations that are coming from uh, human related barriers. So our developments are mainly uh, divided in four different uh, areas. Uh, the first one is the perception area in which uh, thanks to uh, a number of sensors, uh, the system are capable of recognizing uh, both the environment, but also uh, the presence of the humans. Um, the second area is the motion planning, um, and today we are going to uh, have much more details during our session. And here, um, this, uh, uh, thanks to our models, the system are capable of, of recognizing the task that the human are performing, and at the same time, scheduling the task that will be for performed by the robots. Um, and then we have um, the creation of a safe robot uh, motion planning. The third area is dedicated to uh, safety and security. Uh, in the first part, we focus on human safety. Then we have a part dedicated to data uh, security and cybersecurity. We have uh, a model dedicated to human ergonomics and uh, posture correction. And finally, uh, we develop operator trainings uh, through uh, augmented reality. Everything has been possible and has been integrated thanks to uh, a human communication uh, model. 
In our project, we have four different uh, industrial cases. The first one comes from uh, the railway sector and uh, um, it has been performed in Alstom. The second one is um, in, um, dedicated to the metal sector that is um, performed by Chamber in Italy. The capital goods uh, in goods per group from the Basque Country. And finally, uh, SEAT for uh, the automotive market. The um, project has been divided in four different phases uh, um, the requirements and uh, the system conceptualization that was the first part of the project. Then we performed the research and development in all the different research institutes. And currently we are already in the integration and validation phase. So our uh, mock-ups and uh, pre-validated uh, uh, system are moving directly to the industrial environment for uh, the final uh, integration, validation, and definition all, of all the KPIs. So now uh, we are going to see uh, our share work video. I hope uh, you will enjoy this session. Uh, please. In the age of industry 4.0, the industrial landscape is being transformed by technologies, allowing factories to be more connected and automated. Industrial robots have evolved considerably during the past decades, improving in productivity, efficiency and security. But they are still not flexible enough to coexist and share production tasks with humans. The EU-funded project ShareWork aims to provide robots with the necessary intelligence to safely work with humans without the need of protective barriers. Thanks to ShareWork, industrial collaborative robots will be capable of understanding the environment and human behavior. A solution to boost process productivity and improve workers' well-being with better ergonomics and safety at the workplace. The resulting technology will be validated in the assembly areas of four different companies of the automotive, railway, metal and capital goods manufacturing industries to evaluate its applicability in different industrial processes. A new smart robotic system for fostering industrial competitiveness in Europe. To find out more about ShareWork, visit sharework-project.eu or find us on Twitter. Okay, so then uh, we, we will start now with uh, uh, our uh, brief trainings. Uh, we have our first speaker. I'm glad to introduce uh, uh, Alessandro Umbrico uh, from uh, ISCT CNR. He's a researcher working in the Institute of Cognitive Science and Technology in Rome. He received his PhD in 2007 on computer science and automation at University of Roma 3. Uh, he is currently studying uh, socially assistive robotics and human robot collaboration scenario. And uh, thanks to his developments, uh, he is endowing artificial intelligence with the reasoning capabilities needed to adapt their behaviors to changing dynamics to the real uh, world scenarios. So thanks, uh, Alessandro, for coming today. Uh, he will give today the presentation related to safe and effective task, task planning and scheduling for human robotics uh, collaboration. Okay. Hi, thanks, Simona, for the kind introduction. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Yes, please confirm. OK, thanks. So <clears throat> thanks. So I, I'm, as I said, uh, Simona, uh, I'm Alessandro Umbriga, researcher at CNR ISTC. And this is a joint work with Amadeo Cest and Andrea Orlandini from the same Institute and so about the development of task planning technologies for human robot collaboration in shared work. Just really a few words about our institute, uh, which is uh, one of the main institutes in Italy for computer for psychology and cognitive science and so neuroscience and AI. And uh, in particular, I work in the planning and scaling technology lab laboratory where we aim at applying artificial intelligence techniques in particular for planning and scheduling in real world scenarios and we have several kind of application that go from uh, uh, space uh, ambient assisted living and of course manufacturing and robotics 
and in particular this presentation is about one application of some techniques that we are developing here uh, in uh, for human robot collaboration and in particular this this technology is concerned uh, the automated planning in artificial intelligence applied to human robot collaboration so why use task planning in human robot collaboration the, the main objective of task planning is to um, enhance the, the flexibility and the, so somehow the, the intelligence of uh, collaborative robots to, to know the, the production dynamics of the, of the particular collaborative uh, scenarios, the possible behavior of a, of a human operator, and be able to autonomously decide which are the best tasks that uh, should be performed and uh, somehow uh, assign tasks to the human and the, and, the, and the robot in order to achieve uh, an effective collaboration that is also safe, safe and so take into account several factors that uh, allow to, to find a good compromise between the, the efficiency of the overall production cell and the collaborative cell and of course the safety and the, the, the smoothness of the interaction between, the, between the, the human and the robot. And to do so, we apply a particular uh, paradigm of automatic planning, uh, automatic planning in artificial intelligence that is called uh, timeline-based planning. That um, is a, a different uh, paradigm with respect to most known classical planning approach based on, for example, language like TDDL, because it uh, na natively supports the reasoning about time and concurrency. And so it inter interprets a planning problem as a, the, the problem of controlling a complex system that is composed by several uh, domain features, several entities that can evolve uh, autonomously over time. And so the objective of the timeline-based planning is to coordinate the temporal behaviors of these parallel entities in order to achieve some complex behavior that is, it is valid in a particular domain. And so as we will see in this particular, particular context, we want to to, to, to synthesize, to plan the temporal behavior of the human and the robot and coordinate their behavior in order to eff effectively achieve the, uh, a shared objective. So a collaborative task in a, uh, guaranteeing safety and, and the production requirements that are necessary to, to perform a good job, basically. And this, uh, this paradigm has been studied within my, my group and uh, has been applied uh, also in, in several real world contexts that originally were in space applications for we had a long uh, a collaboration with uh, the European Space Agency but this technology has been developed also in NASA to basically to coordinate the behavior of satellite operation or the um, planet, planetary uh, robots but um, we more recently have applied this, this technology also to manufacturing uh, with with some European project like uh, 4x3 and uh, the current project uh, ShareWork, where we specifically address the problem of coordinating uh, uh, human and robot um, uh, agents that co that cooperate in a shared environment that uh, arise several challenges with respect to the controllability because we have to deal with the uncontrollability and the un uh, unpredictable behavior of humans humans so be able to robustly control the robot in order to achieve a, a, an effective collaboration. So uh, this is actually the objective of why we uh, apply timelines to robotics and to, to realize task planning uh, algorithms. So because the, we want to en enhance the flexibility and the ro uh, robustness of the robot controllers. And in particular, we rely on a formalization of timeline-based planning that take into account an explicit representation of temporal flexibility and the temporal uncertainty of the task that can be assigned to the to the human to the human agent, and in this way we are able to synthesize plans that take take into account this uncertainty and are able to uh, coordinate the behavior of the of the robot according to the expected behavior of the human, uh, adapting the the actual coordinate um, interaction among them, and uh, achieve the the realization of the collaborative collaborative process within certain certain time. So guaranteeing uh, certain quality with respect to the expected time that uh, it is needed to complete the production process and, and to take into account so the, the uncertainty of the human and be safe with respect to the expected the possible behavior of the human operator. And to do so, we use the um, an, an um, a framework that we have the, we are currently developing within our research activities that is open source and is uh, 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 we give the possibility to be extended that is and here you can see the basic uh, structure of the framework that compose is composed of three main elements we have a, uh, a representation layer that actually 
provide the functionalities to represent uh, timeline-based model, mo to model timeline-based problems, and to represent timeline-based plans. So we we all the, the, the features that allows the, the functionality that allows us to represent uh, collaborative scenarios in terms of timelines and verify if it is it is valid with respect to the constraints that we want to be satisfied and also to to the controllability aspect of the human operator. We have then a deliberative layer that is, is, is responsible for actually synthesizing plans by achieving some objective functions that uh, allow to coordinate uh, the, the, the behavior of the human operator and achieve the desired objectives. And then we have an executive layer that is responsible for actually executing this, uh, the synthesized plan. So dispatching and coordinating online the, the behavior of the human and the robot by sending commands and receiving feedback about the actual implementation and if necessary adapt the, the execution of a plan uh, dynamically according to the actual behavior of the human for example and the actual state of the overall work work itself and within framework within uh, share work we are applying platinum and we are uh, deploying platinum into uh, ROS uh, through the, our, our framework uh, called the ROXN that uh, is actually responsible to deploy this kind of technology in a ROS based uh, control system so so that we are able to integrate our planning and execution capabilities uh, with any um, I would say industrial robot that is uh, compatible with ROS and so able to to, to interact uh, through standard ROS topics, for example, to to dispatch commands and receive feedbacks about the execution of the expected actions in operations of the robot, and also to, for example, communicate with human operator through some uh, human human uh, system interface that is that are being developed within the sharework in order to. Uh, to keep uh, the user, the human, aware about the expected, the, the tasks that are expected from him, and to be aware about the tasks that the tasks that are being executed by the by the robot, so so that he, he knows which is the the operation that are going to be performing on, in a particular collaborative cell. And this is the actual implementation of a, what we call a Roxanne node, so a goal-oriented uh, timeline-based node uh, into ROS, that is uh, the actual implementation of this deliberative process and executive process that simultaneously uh, reason on, on, a time, on the timeline-based plan that is, that is incrementally built. So actually we have uh, an input topic that we call the goal topic where the deliberative process receives uh, the request for planning some complex collaborative process within the cell. Then we have this process is synthesized you know, into a timeline-based plan that is executed through an executive process. And this executive process actually synthesizes some dispatch through ROS topics, dispatch some commands that are being executed, for example, by the robot and receives the feedbacks about the, the actual execution of these of these uh, of these commands so if the execution goes uh, correctly so everything uh, goes on uh, as planned the the, the the executive is able to dynamically dispatch new commands and uh, until they it execute the, the entire process and collaborative process but in case that we have a failure for example because from uh, the robot that is not able to perform some task or because for example the human operator is working is behaving uh, in a different ways as expected we then the executive process is able to uh, recognize these uh, di divergences between the actual state of the world and the ex expected state of the world according to the plan and so to trigger again the deliberative process to replan and adapt online uh, the, the timeline based plan in order to achieve the the, the desire to complete the, the desired process uh, according to the adapting the, the behavior of the robot to the observed state of the world. And this is also done with this additional topic that allows the, the system, the, the world system to monitor some conditions that we want to, to keep uh, under control during the, the execution of the world, of the world process. And so just a few words about how these uh, a typical collaborative process is modeled with timeline based planning. So consider this typical scenario where we have a, a shared workspace where we have the human on, the, on, a, on one side and the robot on another side. And then in this case, we, the two operators should perform some assemble tasks. So 
they, we have some blue cubes, some orange cubes, and some white cubes that uh, actually uh, re require the, the human and the robot to perform some pick and place uh, operations in order to place the, 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 the cubes of the correct uh, color into a placing area in order to, to build this, this, mos this mosaic, so this, this shape. And then in this case, we have the white cubes that can be moved and uh, worked only by the, the human or human agent. We have the orange cubes that can be worked only by the robot, while the blue cubes can be uh, worked by both of the agents. So it is necess necessary to coordinate the actual motion. So the actual pick and place operations the, the two agents should perform in order to correctly and efficiently uh, build the world, the world shape. So such a, a scenario is implemented uh, as mo is modeled as a timeline-based planning by identifying a, a set of state variables that actually uh, model the possible behaviors of the of the two agents. So we have, uh, for example, a state variable to model the whole process in terms of the task, the for example, the pick and play, the general pick and place tasks that are me, that are necessary to to build the the shape of the mosaic, and then we have the the state variables that model the the, the the operations, the tasks that the human and the robot can perform over time. So, for example, pick uh, an orange cube and place the in a position and, and place the the, or, uh, the orange cube in a in one of the cell of the of the mosaic. And we we are reached this information with some known expected the flexible duration of the task depending on the actual position uh, and the and possible. Uh, in, in, the, in intersection with the human operator. And then we can have also additional state variables to, to model the internal structure of the, of the robot in order to coordinate the, the actual implementation of its task. We, in this case, we, we see a, a, an example that actually is obtained by a, a slightly different domain, but that was not necessary in the example that I, I mentioned before. But for, for example, if you have the robot that should perform a, a, screw, a screwing task, then you may need to coordinate the actual implementation of this task. So you have to coordinate the, the robotic arm in order to, to place the robot in the correct, the, the arm of the robot in the correct position. And then maybe you have to coordinate the, the screwdriver tool in order to activate or deactivate the tool uh, in order to actually screwing or, or unscrewing the, the, the bolt. In, in this example. And then some of these tasks uh, can be controllable, that are the, the blue ones, and while other can be not controllable, like the, 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 the red one. Like in this case, all in, for example, the, all the, the tasks that are performed by the human are not controllable, uh, which means that the, the system, when synthesize a plan and execute the plan, actually, uh, can only assume that the, the duration of this task uh, respects some expected uh, known bounds, like in this case with a lower and upper bound for its duration, but it cannot decide the actual duration. So the system is forced somehow to, to observe the actual duration of this, ta this task and adapt the, 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 the coordination of the robot uh, accordingly if the actual execution does not respect the, the, the model somehow. And the, the same holds uh, in part uh, for the for the robot, like for example, the motion of the robot are not to completely controllable for the system because uh, since we have a shared workspace, well, it, it made sense that the human uh, uh, represents an obstacle for the robot. So in order to avoid the collisions, maybe that the robot should stop or slow down its motion, which means that the actual duration of the motions of the robot are not actually under the control of the of the system. So we can decide when to start a motion, but we cannot know in advance when this motion will will end. So we have to adapt adapt with this and take into account this uncertainty when synthesize the, the operation of the robot and, and and actually control them at the task level implementation. And then these state variables are coordinated, as, as you can see, with some temporal constraints that are called synchronization rules that allow to synthesize timelines, so temporal behaviors of these, these state variables that are that satisfies some some desired temporal constraints. Like for example, in this case, we have that uh, a high-level task uh, that of the process uh, should contains uh, two different tasks: one performed by the human and the 
and the and the robot. So the the actual execution of these two tasks of the human and the robot should occur while performing the high level task that is mentioned in this assembly process state variable, and, and so on. These are some temporal constraints that allow us to synthesize to coordinate the actual evolution of the different timelines of the state variables. And so given this representation, the, the, the planning algorithm works as a general planned refinement algorithm. So we have a set of timelines that starts with unknown states and we iteratively refine these timelines by synthesizing, by deciding with new various new actions that are performed by the human or the robot for example and so uh, solving what we call flows so basically building uh, sequences of temporal values that describe the complete behavior of the related features by satisfying uh, the synchronization rules and so the temporal constraints that uh, are desired and uh, these flows uh, are are iteratively refined until we we found a timeline based plan so a set of timelines that does not contain flows and flows may have part of the timeline that are not specified or tokens so values of the timelines that uh, overlap over time while and we have to to synthesize a complete ordered sequence of of the values that compose each single timeline and to do so to coordinate actually to actually solve these uh, these flows during the solving procedure we apply some heuristics that uh, allow for example to extract a hierarchy from the from the domain specification and like in this case we have a, a, a hierarchical decomposition of the collaborative process in terms of general tasks that the human and robots should perform and the actual implementation of this task with respect to the for example the structure of the robot and this 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 information is used to prioritize the, the flows that we can found over a plan and follow this uh, hierarchical decomposition when synthesizes, synthesizing the plan. And then, uh, in, order, in particular, we respect, we, with respect to shared work, we have developed a, a multi-objective heuristic search function, which uh, allows us to, to, uh, to, evaluate, to, to synthesize plans that uh, take into account uh, multiple uh, par par parameters when synthesizing the actual behavior of the robot and the human, and in particular, we take into account, of course, the the needs, the operational needs, so the the, the task that uh, should be performed to to correctly implement a collaborative process. But also, we take into account the the parallel behavior of the human and the robot, and uh, we build uh, uh, um, we use a, a, a what we we know as syn a syner synergy matrix. So where actually we take into account the possible overlapping of the human and the robot task, and take into account uh, a kind of uh, risk factor that uh, uh, express the the risk of collision or so the, the risk of uh, slowing down the task of the robot because of the the, the closeness between the, the human and the robot so in this way we are able to uh, using a pareto based uh, heuristic search we are able to combine the information about the general efficiency of the process so for example the cycle time uh, uh, needed to complete the collaborative process with information about the synergetic uh, interaction between the human and the robot. So in order to minimize the, the risk of collision between the human and the robot when performing the, the tasks that uh, will be assigned to them. And in this way, we, we found a, a compromise actually between the, which is the, between the efficiency of the, of the overall process and the, and the safety of the human, because we want to minimize also the, uh, the the cycle time of course but we want to also to minimize the risk of collision between the human and the robot so we will synthesize uh, assignment between uh, human and robot tasks that uh, reduce the the risk of uh, collision physical collision between the human and the robot and also this plan this timeline based plan has been synthesized uh, uh, this this set of timelines uh, are executed through a timeline based execution procedure which uh, uh, iteratively decide uh, which are the, the tasks that can be dispatched and so sent to the robot or communicated to the human for the actual execution, and then receive some feedback about the execution of this task and adapt the, the process if necessary. And we, as I said, uh, we can have different uh, situations, like, uh, for example, tasks that are completely under the control of the robot, so we can decide when to start and when to comp when to end the execution of this task but we can have some tasks that are not completely controllable so that can
can be partially controllable, like for example, the motion of a robot, we can, or more in general, the pick and place operation of, of the robot. We can decide when to start a pick and place operation, but then we have to observe the actual com completeness of this operation during during the execution because we don't know which is the exact exact time the robot will take to complete this pick and place because of the coexistence with the human. And other values that, as we said, are completely uncontrollable because, uh, for example, the tasks that are assigned to the human are, are not uh, in, under the control of the system. So we can communicate to the human which is the task that uh, we expect the human will perform within the, the process. But we cannot know neither when the human will actually start that uh, that process, ne neither when it will complete that, that task. And so this is all. Info this information should be observed during the execution of the of the collaborative plans and be able to adapt in case that something goes different or go goes wrong with respect to the to the plan. And here we can see just a a, a brief demonstration. In a, for a simulation that we for a work that we made together with Marco Faroni from CNR Schema, where we actually implement this the, this system, we actually imp deployed the, our plan timeline based planning execution uh, software capabilities, and we have integrated it with the task with the motion action planning uh, model developed by by Marco that he will give a talk about this, and here we can see how. Actually, the system is able to coordinate the the, the behavior of the human and the, and the robot. And here, with this graph in particular, we can see the, for example, the objective function of the of the task planning system, where uh, actually its obje objective is to keep uh, as much close as possible the the make span of the robot and the human. So, in in sense that reduce, for example, the idle time of the human and the robot, and so achieve a, a collaborative plan that uh, see the both agents work uh, somehow the, the same amount of time by also taking into account the cumulative risk of the of the collaborative process and so trying to, to reduce it. And this is a, a kind of uh, in the actual implementation that we have developed and we are and we are currently deploying this technology in the real scenarios of the of the Sherrock project. And here is, a, as I said, a complete simulation that we have realized uh, with our colleagues from CNR Stima. And just to give some few words about how to use these, we have uh, deployed it uh, with the Roxanne framework, which is still, uh, which is again uh, open source and is uh, compatible with ROS Mel Melodic, and it has been developed with, using ROS Java and. In general, this uh, this framework is is uh, provides, as I said, the the basic functionalities functionalities to allow the deployment of timeline based planning uh, and the Platinum software into into Rock, into ROS. And uh, the, the the function of the system is general. Uh, it, the idea is that you can customize the the deployment of this uh, framework uh, using some configuration files where you basically want to. Want, you can specify which are the topics that you are going to use to actually uh, share information with the goal-oriented uh, acting node that we have developed within Roxen. So here you can see the XML file that uh, specified the, the standard uh, configuration of the of the framework, where we you can specify the goal topic. So you specify the name of the topic, the format of the message that is expected, and the the, the class, the Java class that is in charge of get receive taking this message and, and convert it to the to the structure of the uh, accept accepted by Roxen. Here are some classes that already do this job uh, with the format of message uh, defined within Roxen. And so you have this uh, general input topic, the go topic. You have the environment topic that uh, is used to get the observation. And then you have this couple of topics that where that you can use to dispatch command and receive feedback about the dispatcher command. So in this case, these white cards are used to are used to specify that all the uh, all the all the um, tokens, so all the, all the values uh, the, of the timelines uh, should be executed uh, through this couple of topics. So every Every values of every values of the timelines of the plan will be will be dispatched to this topic and will be expected to receive a feedback on this on this topic by by Roxanne. 
and this is the, the default configuration. Then you have uh, the possibility to to extend the framework by defining your own uh, elements of the of the planner. For example, you can develop your own search strategy that you can integrate within uh, within the planner by implementing the desired the needed callbacks that are called during the the, the reasoning of the planner. And the same holds for the heuristic evaluation function. You can extend the framework by developing your own. Uh, it is modular, so you can easily integrate it and also evaluate different uh, configurations of the framework. Um, and then we can, as I said, you can customize the deployment of Roxanne by editing this uh, XML file that where you can specify different, uh, uh, for example, different uh, topics or different formats of message that you want to support within the framework, uh, like in this case, for example, where we have these these topics that we uh, are the ones that we have used to interact with the action and motion planner developed by our colleague from Milan, from Stima. And in this case, you we have defined a different topic with a, spe a specific custom message that we have developed, and we have integrated into uh, into our framework within ShareWork the the the, ob the class, for example, the the um, the object that were responsible for uh encapsulating the logic for translating the format of the message in the correct way and pass all the information needed and and, and interpret the data uh, for the dispatching the right command to the motion planner or the action planner and for receiving and interpreting the correct feedback from the action plan in order to proceed the execution of the timeline based plan and that's all from my side. So we are, as I said, we are currently implement, deploying this technology on on, in, on the pilot use case. We have just initial deployment for, the, in particular, the the Chambre and the and the Goitsper scenario of the of the so, so two of the four scenarios of the of the work of the of the project. And we are uh, developing. We are refining this technology you know, to achieve more flexible control and also to to support uh, some level of personalization with respect to the interaction with the human in order to uh, use the task planning system and also to uh, for personalizing the the synthesis of the of the collaborative plans according to the known features and skills of the of the human operators so in order to for example uh, allow the system to be able to reason about the uh, different profiles of workers for example for with expert workers or uh, new workers that um, for example does, does not really does not know really well the whole process and the whole uh, operation that should be performed so in order and this way allow the planner to synthesize the the assign the task in different ways according to the expected uh, skills of, of the human uh, operator that take part of the collaborative process so that's all from my side and i thank you for your attention and will i will answer to your question if any so thanks. Thanks a lot, Alessandro, uh, for this uh, clear presentation. Um, so if you have any question, uh, please uh, drop them in the, in the question and answer uh, um, tab, uh, because we are going to have a, a slot at the end of this session dedicated to the questions. Um, now we have a self-assessment questionnaire to see if you have uh, if you were awake during this presentation. So here you have uh, um, our survey. So why um, is timeline-based planning suitable to deal with the human-robot co collaboration? So uh, the first answer, A, um, because plans are sequences of robot action optimized independently from possible human interactions. Uh, B, uh, because plans optimize uh, um, collaborative processes take into account human uncertainty, time and safety. So you have about uh, 30 seconds to reply uh, to this um, question, to this question. Okay, I see that just the 29% of the audience uh, replied. Let's see. Let's try to reach at least the 
Okay, 60%, so yeah, let's see. Now, okay, um, everybody replied B. So yeah, if you want to comment a bit, I think it is the correct one, but please, uh, Alessandro, if you want to say something. <laughs> yes, yes, two easy questions. Yes, no, the, the current answer is B, of course, and so this is actually the main contribution of timeline-based planning. That that is the main reason that we, for why we use these uh, this technology in these scenarios, even this natural being to control uh, to coordinate a controllable entities like a robot with uh, an uncontrollable entities like a human. So uh, it is important to deal with uh, uncertainty and these. Uh, uh, about the, the the behavior of the of the human and so be able to synthesize solutions that are uh, robust when you actually execute them in the real scenario yeah i'm i'm glad to see that you explained really well because i think it's our first time we get 100 percent correct uh, <laughs> so thanks a lot uh, for the lecture and uh, now we have also another brief uh survey and uh, in the meanwhile, we are also getting ready for our next presentation um, that will be given by Marco Faroni. It's um, somehow um, fitting really well with the one just given by Alessandro, complementing it to some extent. I think. I, I see that there is already one question uh, for Alessandro in the chat. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's finalized. So now uh, we are going to move to our next uh, course given by Marco. Marco. Um, yes. Can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to see you here as a speaker. Marco is a researcher from CNR's team, as Alessandro introduced before. His research activity focuses on motion planning of robotics manipulators, combined uh, task and motion planning. And um, um, since a few years, he, he has led the motion planning and task and motion planning task in different European projects. And today he's going to give us a, a presentation about offline, real-time, human-aware, safe motion planning. So the floor is yours, Marco. Thank you, Simona. Uh, so yeah, as Simona said, I'm Marco Faroni from uh, the Institute STIMA of the National Research Council of Italy. And uh, today's presentation will deal with um, motion planning in human role collaborative applications in shared work. Okay, so I'll start with a brief introduction and motivation uh, that drove our, our work in shared work. And then I'll go into details uh, with the approach that we develop in, within the project, uh, speaking of the three main modules of our architecture. And finally, I'll give some uh, references to the papers and to the code, which is all open source. So you are welcome to take a look at it and use it uh, if you find it useful. So let's start with the motivation. Uh, of our work. Um, as you may know, Share Work aims to develop an all around approach to human robot collaboration uh, regarding how the robot moves uh, uh, when a human operator is near the robot. Uh, current industrial solutions lack of flexibility in the sense that trajectories are usually computed offline, uh, program point by point, for example. And when the human enters the robot working areas, the robot speed is reduced or uh, even stopped. Uh, this approach leads to frequent uh, safety stops and to a poor collaboration, both in terms of productivity and flexibility. So our goal is to change this paradigm uh, by computing the trajectories online, so just before their execution, uh, so that we can consider the current position of the human and optimize the path uh, and so we can avoid speed reductions as much as possible if they are not uh, really necessary. 
So in shared work, we propose a hierarchical solution uh, composed of three main modules, the action planner, um, the human aware path planner, and a reactive local planner. The action planner is in charge of converting high level task specifications from the task planner, for example, as Alessandro mentioned before, into a set of robot movements. Uh, then we have the path planner that takes as input uh, the action specification and uh, it can plan for a collision free paths uh, that avoids the interference with the human. And that's based on uh, the real time position of the human. Uh, that is measured usually uh, through a human tracking system, for example, from a vision, uh, vision system. Uh, finally, the reactive planner is in charge of modifying the trajectory in real time at around one kilohertz, for example, and that uh, is needed to ensure the safety. So let's start with the first module. Uh, well, let's start with the human aware path planner. Uh, the key idea here uh, is to compute trajectories on the fly so that we can consider the current position of the human. Um, to do so, we need to achieve uh, uh, small planning latencies, uh, let's say less than one second. And we need to find a criterion to consider the human state in the motion planning problem. About the first point, so reducing planning latency, our, uh, our work focuses on designing fast and optimal sampling-based algorithms, uh, so in the style of RRT star, for uh, who is uh, familiar with this kind of algorithms. And for that, we built on Inform RRT star, which is an RRT-like algorithm with uh, improved convergence rate. And uh, we work to improve the search strategy by alternating uh, global sampling and sampling the neighborhood uh, of the best solution so far. So some kind of trade-off between exploration and uh, exploitation. And this has led to an improvement of the convergence rate compared to existing methods. For example, you can see in the three plots um, here uh, where we compare our shared work approach, uh, so our path planner, to uh, existing state-of-the-art state of the art algorithms, for example, from OMPL. And uh, basically, we got a reduced planning uh, time and a better uh, solution uh, cost. Then regarding the second point, so how to embed the interference in the motion planning problem, uh, we found out that existing works uh, tend to find a trade-off between the path minimization and the maximization of the distance from the human. Uh, this criterion is somewhat arbitrary, and the results strongly depends on manual tuning of the, of the weights, for example. Uh, so our approach is to define a motion planning problem that, let's say, um, explicitly consider how much the robot will slow down if the robot passes uh, at a certain distance from the, from the human. And the main idea is to embed the safety rules from uh, the ISO TS15066 in a cost function and solve the planning problem uh, with the RRT method that I just mentioned. Uh, on the right, for example, you can see an example of the trajectories computed with a normal, so non human aware path planner, and the trajectory computed by our human aware path planner. And you can see that the robot uh, tends to avoid the areas near, for example, in this case, the, the human hand. And uh, in that way, it avoids unnecessary slow down, uh, slowdowns uh, that would occur if the human, if the robot would go close to the, um, to the human. Uh, the second module is the reactive local planner, uh, which is in charge of um, slowing down the robot according to the real-time position of the human. And uh, to do so, we use a model predictive control approach in which we embedded safety rules again from ISO TS15066 uh, to determine in real time the maximum robot speed at each time instance, so with a, a high sampling rate in the order of one kilohertz, for example. And in this way, we can optimize the speed reduction instead of using the classic uh, uh, green, yellow, uh, red uh, uh, safety zones. Uh, in the video, for example, you can see an implementation of the algorithm uh, in the chamber scenario uh, of ShareWork. 
And the value uh, that you see in the box uh, on the right uh, screen is the speed ratio calculated by uh, the model predictive controller and sent to the robot controller as uh, the speed override. And you can see that it slows down according to the human position. When the human approaches the robot, the, the robot slows down. Uh, it does so, let's say, smartly in the sense that, um, for example, the robot wouldn't slow down in case the robot trajectories uh, were uh, going away from the human, uh, while it would slow down only in case uh, the relative velocity uh, between the human and the robot uh, would bring to a collision. Uh, we also develop um, a replanning module that can be used in case uh, we want to change also the path in real time. Um, so we don't just change our speed to avoid collisions, but we continuously check for new paths uh, as soon as an obstacle comes in the in the robust way. Um, I won't spend spend too much time on this, but the idea is to start with a set of paths um, from start to goal. And in case a current, the current path in execution is in collision because the obstacle moves moved in the in the robust way, uh, we look for a path from the current position to another path of the initial group. And the search algorithms uh, run with a sampling rate of around uh, 10, 20 Hertz. And uh, in case the, the, the path is still feasible, it tries to optimize the current path. So we have these uh, replanning or uh, optimization phases online uh, by using uh, still the, uh, some RRT uh, variants of, the, of our algorithm. Uh, here you can see some preliminary results. Um, so the human was modeled just with a, a big bounding box and uh, the measurement is actually pretty noisy. But apart from that, uh, you can see that the robot changes the path uh, as soon as the human uh, occludes the path that is in execution. And uh, so differently from the approach I mentioned before, uh, here we can change the path to avoid uh, even the, the robot stop because of safety. So let's move to the third module, uh, which is the higher in the hierarchy, uh, the action planner, which embeds the motion planners that I mentioned before. And uh, its objective is to convert high level specifications from the past planner into a sequence of uh, actual robot movements. The idea here is to abandon point, point by point programming and to program basic skills that the robot will solve online through the motion planners. I'll just show uh, an example of uh, how a picking action can be converted into a sequence of basic operation. Uh, the basic operations can be uh, open and close the gripper or can be uh, some point to point movement performed by the robot. Uh, as you can see in the graph on the, on, in the picture on the right, uh, if the task planner asks the robot to pick a blue cube and the action planner queries the database uh, to get all the objects uh, of the type of blue cube that are present in the scene and then it creates a motion planning problem uh, where the goals are all the grasping poses of all the blue cubes in the scene and uh, once this motion planning problem is initialized uh, it is sent to the motion planner that returns um, the optimal trajectory Okay, so here you can see in the video that the robot uh, uh, receives the task from the task planner and uh, puts it in, in execution uh, by, let's say, optimizing the, the selection of the goal. So in this case, the selection of among all the yellow cubes. And uh, while the um, speed scaling is activated to avoid uh, the, the collision with, uh, with the human. Okay, so these are just some results that we got in collaboration with the colleagues at uh, CNR ISTC, uh, where we show how the combination of our action planner and their task planner 
uh, can reduce, for example, the execution time of the whole process, and it can uh, reduce the idle time uh, of both the robot and the and the human, and it can increase the concurrent time um, that the human and the robot uh, uh, work simultaneously. So finally, here are some references, uh, especially to the code. Uh, um, so notice that all our code is freely available and it works in ROS. And in particular, you can use our path planner in MoveIt, just uh, just like OMPL, for example. And uh, the reactive planner, for example, is a ROS node that can publish the speed override uh, uh, to the robot controller, while the action planner is uh, compatible with MoveIt uh, and uh, any motion planners in, uh, in ROS. Uh, you can find uh, all our code in uh, these two uh, GitHub pages. Um, so feel free to use it. And if you have any issue or question, uh, just feel free to contact me or my colleague, Nicola, and we'll uh, be uh, more than glad to help. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be here to answer all your questions. Thanks, Marco, for the presentation. So now again, we move to our first uh, questioner for the attendees. So here you have a Marco question. Why is human aware machine learning important to enhance uh, human robot collaboration? A, it reduces the robot energy consumption. B, it enhances uh, human comfort and reduces safety stops. C, it increases the vari variety of tasks that can be automated. So let's see, 30% of the people already bought. seconds more um, okay here you have uh, the answers the 91 percent of uh, the people uh, watching us replied b and the nine percent replied c so please marco you want to quickly comment on that uh, yeah, I can see the the question from my screen. Can you please repeat the B and C question so I can comment? Uh, sorry, Marco, I didn't get you. Uh, I can't see the questions from my screen. So if you can please. Uh, okay, yeah, um, the ninety one percent replied the correct one. It enhances human comfort and reduces safety stops. Uh, but the 9% replied uh, uh, the it increases the variety of tasks that can be automated. Is the last one okay. uh, completely wrong or it can be also considered somehow? Uh, it is not completely wrong in the sense that, uh, for example, uh, thanks to uh, the action planner that we developed, uh, uh, it is actually easier to automate tasks. Uh, and um, so, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, we are trying to overcome the point-by-point uh, -point programming uh, uh, paradigm by using a task-oriented programming paradigm. And uh, so, yeah, in that sense, um, that helps a lot to, to make uh, more complex tasks. Uh, for example, during the project, we, um, uh, we performed some, some experiments with the Chambers operator uh, to test our um, task-oriented programming paradigm. Uh, we develop um, an HMI, uh, so a graphical interface for the operators to program. And in that sense, yeah, it's partially correct. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the correct answer is actually B, in the sense that human awareness uh, mainly uh, helps to um, helps the human to perceive a more natural sense of collaboration between the human and the robot 
and it can it can help the productivity of the of the process by, for example, uh, avoiding unnecessary slow uh, slowdown of the robot, safety stops of the robot, and that's the main purpose that drove our work in uh, in share work. Okay, so so I'm really glad to see that uh, the the people that are replying to our question are really um, active and also awake, uh, replying properly to our questionnaires. So here you have also our last survey, um, and uh, like in uh, 30 seconds uh, uh, we will go for a quick uh, coffee, um, and we'll be back at three time. Uh, for our last uh, presentation and also for our roundtable with the session of uh, question and answer. Okay then, so thanks a lot for staying here and uh, see you in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back to our first training activity of um, Sherlock Project that is today dedicated to motion planning. Uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, our last speaker, Julian Urain, uh, that is um, almost finishing his in Intelligent Autonomous System um, in the Technical University of Darmstadt. His main field of research are imitation learning and density estimation for robot motion generation. And his main contribution in Sherwell Project is in the field of building gesture and motion to represent and predict human motion. So thanks a lot for being here today, Blender. Uh, so today is going to give the presentation regarding predictive probabilistic models for robotics. So the floor is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's start. Okay. So hello, everybody. As Simona has introduced me, I'm Julian Urain. I'm a PhD student, PhD candidate here in TU Darmstadt in Germany. And my focus on my research is mostly on uh, machine learning and robotics and how can we integrate both worlds together. And in today's talk, I, I'm going to focus on introducing uh, predictive probabilistic models for robotics. So let's start. So the topic of my talk is related with the work that I've been doing in, in the Sherwood project, and it's mainly based on the prediction. And the question will be like, why do we want prediction in robotics, or what do we mean with prediction? So uh, in order to have a safe collaboration of human and robots, as the image that we have here in the, in the left, uh, we would like to be able to estimate what the human is going to do in the future, such that the robot can adapt better to the human motions and rather help him in a more efficient way or rather to plan ahead and avoid collisions and guarantee a more safe uh, interaction. In order to do that, what a predictive model should do is based on the movements that the human has done, we should be able to try to figure out what is going to be the movements of the human in a certain horizon, in, the, in a certain horizon in the future. So the classical methods to integrate the human movement and the human prediction or the human motion prediction and the human occupancy in robotic cells is usually with very fixed models. In these situations, uh, the, the, a very classical case is when you have like some predefined regions of collision and if the human enter in these regions then the robot could reduce its velocity or even stop. This is actually a very fixed model and is very task specific and for different tasks we may have different, uh, we may require different uh, definitions of the safe regions. In our case what we are exploring is integrating machine learning or data-driven based models that will predict which regions of the space will be occupied in the future. If we integrate these uh, future occupancy regions in our models, then uh, the motion planning or the, even the, the motion control uh, methods that Marco has introduced before 
they could enhance from this information and make safer plans. This allow us to having models like learned models that can adapt to any possible task. And yes, the only thing that our system needs to do is like we need only to observe the data of where the human has been in the future and build uh, and train and learn a predictive model that will tell us where the human is going to be in the future. So this provides us very high adaptability with respect to the low adaptation that the classical methods has. Additionally, and like the, in the case of my work, I'm building uh, probabilistic models. And the question would be like, why do we need probabilistic models in this type of setups? And one of the reasons is that if we really think on the future, the future is a stochastic. And even if we are now in a certain uh, deterministic position or deterministic moment, the places in which we may be in the future is probabilistic. We have a distribution of solutions. And this is actually what we are aiming to learn. So given where the human is now, which is the probability of the human occupying different regions in the future for a certain long horizon or short horizon region? The intuition of these models are coming from the autonomous driving, in which, given some data on how other uh, cars move or how the human moves, the robot, like the robot, in this case the car, can plan to the future, taking into consideration where he thinks that the humans or the other cars are going to be in the future. For in yes. Okay. So before entering on how we, I have defined my method, I'm going to introduce what is a probabilistic density function. Uh, a probability function or a probability density function is just a model that represents the variability of a certain variable. In this case, for example, we are observing a kernel density estimation model in which the curve that we have here is presenting the regions that are more likely to have points. As we can see, the regions in which you have the more, more black dots, that is the data, will be more probable, and the regions with le the less dots are going to be least probable. In our work, what we are trying to do is we are trying to learn these models to represent the occupancy of the unit. A probability density function has like a few properties, such that the integral of the probability should sum to one, such as is a density function, like a probability density function. And as I say, like the idea is that given that we have a certain data set that is composed of n data points x, we aim to learn a distribution p or a well row that uh, depends on this variable over which we have the data. Here, for example, there is a very simple case in which the data are these half moons that we have here, and we are going to train a model that is going to try to fit the data. Uh, the blue regions are low probability regions and the green regions are the high probability regions. If we execute our uh, data, like our learning model, we can see how here, how the model is training. And we can see how after a few iterations, we are able to put high probability regions in the regions where the point, data point is and low probability in the rest. Okay. Additionally, uh, in this work in particular, we are interested in learning conditioned models. In particular, the type of conditioning that we are interested in is uh, conditioned on where the human has been in the past. Our probabilistic model is going to tell us the probability of the human occupying some regions in a certain future, given a certain observations of the past. So zero to t is like, t will be like the current moment, zero will be like the past, and we have observe the human movement from zero to t in the time, and then we want to predict the position in the future in t plus one, but it will be t plus two or t plus three, depending on the interest of the of the of the engineer when learning the model. So how we define it, the human like how is our use case? This is the workspace that we are assuming and we have some observations that we can observe in which, so this could be like some regions that are occupied by the human. We have detected with a, a 3D camera the, the, occupa, the, the regions that are occupied by the human. This is just the observations of the human interacting with the environment. Our objective is to learn a model 
that could represent given this information where the human is going to be in the future. Okay. So the model that we are proposing is it has like multiple parts. On the one hand, we need, I mean, our model, the, the distribution P uh, is condition is it has like two input variables. On the one hand, we have the variable C, that is the conditioning variable that will depend on the observations of the past. And on the other hand, we have the variable X. The variable X is a query. The learner model should provide us the probability of a certain point. Given that we have learned this model, if we query afterwards some 3D points in the space, our model is going to tell us how probable it is in the future this particular 3D point to be occupied given that we have observed in the past some C information from the human. To do so, what we are doing is like we are, in order to have a usable um, usable system, what we have is like some point cloud observations that we fit into a normal distribution. And then we use the mean and the variance of the normal distribution as the conditioning variables of our learned normalizing flow. That is our learned distribution. So we do it like that. We, we have some data and we are going to fit the data to train both the conditioning variable and the query points. Let us assume that this is our data. We will have like tons and tons of data of the human interacting with this environment. In our case, what we are assuming is that we are going to predict where the human will be in the next 20 seconds in the future, given five seconds in the past. To do so, what we do is like we take like the whole trajectories of information that we have of the human, and for every single instant in the time, we are going to split the data between the old data and the future data. The old data is going to be used to train the conditioning model, and the new data is going to be used to train the query points. We expect that the query point to give us high probability if the, the, if the point is in the data, and low probability if it's not. I'm going to show here uh, uh, the model evaluation that we have done. So, here we have some observations of a human performing, uh, interacting with the environment. And in this moment, so let me stop. In this moment, we didn't start the training of the model. I want to remark that what we are doing is a continuous learning model. What it means is that at the beginning of the process, we don't have a model training. The model doesn't know nothing. And as we can see, it's saying that the probability is here, but it's just a random choice. Is just the initialization of them of the model. In a certain moment, we are going to start training the model given the observations of the human. Let's see. Okay. So in this moment, I have initialized the, mod the training of the model, and the model is starting. Along this process, we will see that the model, like okay, just before continuing. The green regions means high probability regions, and the black or gray regions are low probability regions. So the model currently is getting us information, the position of the human, and is telling you which positions in the space are more likely to be occupied in the future. If we leave it training for a certain moment, we will see that Usually, the human is working in this region of the workspace. And as we can see, the model kind of collapsed to this region. Nevertheless, if the human appears, the network con con conditions on it. And for example, here, when the human moves to a different place, the distribution also shifts to this region because it knows that if the human is working here, there are more likely, it's more likely that the human will continue here rather than going to the other place. In the moment that the human goes from the space, in the moment that, they, that it does not have any more information of where the human is because the human is not in the workspace, he puts again the distribution more or less distributed along the possible different regions in the workspace. 
We remark that this could be interesting that if we have multiple workspaces, the distribution will shift between one workspace or the other workspace depending on where the human is. We wanted to make this module as modular as possible, and therefore we integrated the module in ROS. In order to do that, what we did is like we built a, a ROS module that has like multiple input variables. On the one hand, we can input like a set of pose arrays that will be the query points, and additionally another pose arrays that will be the conditioning variables. As output or model is going to provide us the probability in a kind in a list of arrays for every single point in the queries. Finally, also like if the audience is interested in using this module, we have available the module in Docker, and it's in the following appendix. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. For the presentation, um, I remind to the attendees that they, if they want to ask something, uh, you can just write the question in the box. And now we are going to move to the uh, to our survey uh, and question. So, why is a human movement prediction model useful in motion planning? A, it used uh, to plan safer motion. B, to imitate the human with the robot. C, to avoid the human reactively. So you have uh, about one minute to reply to this question. We have already the 20% of the attendees that replied. Twenty seconds to the end of the questioner. Mm, ten more. The fifty percent of the attendees replied, but yeah, here we have fifty fifty. Can you see the answers? The, they replied 50 So it can be used to plan safer motion and the 50% C to avoid okay. human reactivity. Yeah, my it's, idea my, my idea here was to actually like the three of them are, are good cases. In this in this particular case, we are we are using it for the first one. We are using it for to avoid to plan safely. But I wanted to use also the question to, to remark again that. We can also use it to, to in a kind of a reactive motion controller or also for to imitate the human. So actually the three of them were actually valid to some extent. Yet my my, my example was the A. Okay, so yeah, thanks uh, again for your presentation. We have uh, our last uh, survey for the quality of the session just to make sure that you enjoy you are enjoying our training activities and also our next one that will be the last one of uh, this uh, round of sessions we have a question for you Julian. you can see it yeah Okay, so uh, Luigi Calegari is asking if I can explain a little bit, a little bit more of the type of predictor I am using. Uh, yes. Um, so the type of predictor that I'm using is uh, normalizing flow. Uh, the normalizing flows are a type of uh, distribution models, like deep, deep learning based distribution models that are like extremely expressive. And they are like, we, uh, I hear like some noise. I don't know if Simona or okay. So the yeah the, the normalizing flows are like very powerful um, deep learning based models, and they have become very popular in the last few years in the machine learning community because they can express uh, very difficult distributions. Like the, the previous cases, like before, like maybe uh, ten years ago or something. 
the, maybe the most common cases to represent these continuous space distributions were like the Gaussian measure models. But these Gaussian measure models are not sufficiently expressive. And in my case, I'm using yes, I'm using these normalizing flows that can encode like very, very difficult distributions and very difficult shapes. I didn't went into much details uh, in the presentation because I wanted to make it accessible to everybody, but I can share some documents with respect to the how this, this model works. And I think you have the contact of Luigi, so in the case yeah. you have any other um, material support on that, so you can get yeah. that. Uh, so now we open uh, the discussion session uh, with all the speakers. Um, so I kindly ask uh, Marco and Alessandro to open the camera. And uh, yeah, and to start uh, the question and answer uh, slot. So I think that there are a few topics that uh, you would like to detail a bit more and to see if there is any participation of uh, the attendees. Uh, you know that uh, you can write everything in the chat box, but you can also uh, raise the, the hand if you want to participate. So we'll just give you the permission uh, and you can enter uh, the discussion with all of us. Um, Alessandro, are you going to share a few slides, isn't it? Uh, yes, Simona, I suppose I'm sharing, So, uh, but it seems that you can't see my slide, right? I, I'm still uh, uh, seeing the last um, survey. Okay. 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 Yes. Meanwhile, yeah. Alessandro, oh. you can okay, see. Okay, just now. the one. Yeah. Okay. Before starting the discussion, there is also a, a question for you. Uh, so um, um, they are asking: uh, um, Is the task assignment fixed for human or robot? How about dynamic task assignment? Uh, okay. So, uh, yes, thanks for the question. No, um, the task assignment is not static. I mean, uh, in the timeline-based model, you actually should uh, describe all the, the, the possible assignment of tasks. So you have done make a decision. Is, is the planner that once synthesized the plan, uh, decide uh, how to assign tasks to the human and the robot, uh, optimizing the, the metrics that I mentioned while during the presentation. So trying to compromise between the efficiency and the and the, the safety, for example, or other factor that you want to take into account uh, within your objective function of the task planner. So when you then synthesize a plan, within the plan you have some fixed choices that uh, anyway you start executing the plan with these fixed choices. But it can be the case that you have to replan dynamically online if something goes wrong or if it doesn't be if it doesn't goes on as expected. So in that case, uh, the planner starts from uh, suppose that uh, in the middle of the process uh, something you have a failure of the robot or whatever. In that case, the planner replan. So it means that uh, which means that uh, it it uh, try to complete the missing part of the process by finding a different assignment between the task of the human and the robot that achieve the, the objective. So in that case, you dynamically change the, the assignment uh, of the human and the robot, but only if some exogenous events or some failure occurs during the execution. Otherwise, it goes on with the initial decisions and the initial, initial assignment that uh, should be somehow optimal with respect to the metrics that you have selected. So that's the, the point. <clears throat> Okay, thanks for uh, the answer. I think uh, it replies to the question. And thanks also to Hamed Abide for the for the question. So if you need any other details, just let us know. And so please, uh, Alessandro, the floor is yours for the discussion. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have prepared some topics for discussion, taking into account some aspects that uh, we believe are uh, important uh, in this kind of 
application. So also to design, I would say, novel and innovative solution for human robot collaboration. And maybe I just uh, read this one first topic and some correlated question, and we have may have some discussion about this. So <clears throat> the first point was concerned the uh, concerned the human factor, and so industry 4.0 and cyber physical systems are pushing an even tighter and symbiotic interaction between humans and robotic or artificial actors within production systems. In this regard, the human factor will strongly affect the efficacy and acceptance of robotic solutions and should be taken into account into the deployment path since early stages. So some questions that uh, we play, we put to foster some discuss the discussion is uh, uh, how human actors and more in general human stakeholders sufficiently involved into the technological development of this solution and to which extent current technologies are effectively capable of robustly dealing with human related issues like example, aging preferences, heterogeneous skills, uh, behavioral uncertainty, uh, safety, trust, and, and so whatever. So these are just two points that we want like to discuss to so to discuss the the relevance of human factor in this kind of application. That sometimes it seems not so central as it should be. I I think. So I don't know if uh, Mark or Hulen want to say something or some model from the audience want to say something about this? So, yeah, maybe I can give you a, a few points here. So, in my opinion, it's actually true. I guess that most of the technology it's done, uh, is developed, like, without taking into consideration most of the human stakeholders. Yet, I, I also believe that some of the technology that remains in the future has some type of Darwinism process in which we develop a lot of technology and then the ones that adapt, they adapt and then maintain in the, in the industry and those that don't, then they, they will simply remain in the, in the academia or whatever. So I, I don't know if, if, there, if the more human stakeholders should be taken into consideration in this case or just simply develop so much, so much of technology and from pure Darwinism, those that are valid to remain in the, in the industry. Um, okay, I can give a brief comment on that. Um, okay, I like the the idea of uh, say technological Darwinism that you then mentioned. Uh, more specifically for for planning and for uh, the let's say software that we develop. Uh, uh, for example, in my case, motion planning, but that I think it extends also to task planning and uh, human robot uh, collaboration in general. Um, the human actors uh, are not so involved, but for many reasons. And the main one is probably that it's not so easy to involve uh, uh, a large amount of people from companies, for example, like uh, human operators. We are often uh, we often struggle with, uh, let's say, uh, experimental campaign uh, where we involve only students. Uh, or just a few operators, and that's uh, kind of a bottleneck to the experimentation. And uh, we try to to do some steps in this sense in share work, but uh, there is a lot of work to do uh, still. Because uh, yeah, you may develop a, a, an algorithm, a software package, uh, and you test it with the researchers, with students, but with people that are already used to work with this kind of uh, of softwares and technology in general. So robot, they're used, they're used to robots, they're used to coding, for example. So they're not the normal use case. And uh, so there is some kind of bias in, in, in that sense. Um, so that's it. Yes, if I can add uh, from a coordination point of view, uh, I feel that, for example, in the Shower project, we are trying to involve all the stakeholders, but it's true that uh, considering the research environment, we are always trying to validate at the beginning, in the first phases, our algorithms, our models with the people that are involved in the project, obviously. And it's true that at the end, we also 
experienced some problem, for example, in terms of, you know, different kind of clothes that uh, were not uh, uh, used by the researcher or the validation or also proportion, you know, girls in the specific sectors too. So sometimes, yes, the variety can be like uh, a bit strained in this specific uh, field. And yeah, for sure, it can be at least a, a problem, but for sure, it's also part of, you know, the PRL of the project to start with, you know, a small group and try to increase it. And let's see how the validation steps will go uh, with the real environment soon. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your comments and maybe we can move to the next discussion topic. I don't know. Or from the audience, it doesn't seem that there is any anyone that want to add something. Okay, so uh, moving to the second <coughs> discussion topic, which concern artificial intelligence in general. So. Uh, advancement in artificial intelligence and robotics are fundamental to allow modern production systems and industrial collaborative robots to achieve higher levels of flexibility and efficiency. However, the added value of AI techniques and the integration with robotics seems still largely unexplored from a practical point of view. And here we have three questions actually. So which are the limits and open challenges of current AI technologies that limit the wide and extensive use of such technologies in, in real world practical problems? Can classical symbolic AI relies on more general intelligence necessary to effectively address heterogeneous tasks and thus overcome typical limitations of current AI based solutions? An example solutions mainly based on machine learning and specialized on specific narrow tasks and three do you think that contributions from other research fields like cognitive science would be necessary to realize production systems that are better with respect to safety and trust and for example better take advantage of the con coexistence of human and robotic agents and yeah this is just a, a in particular this is a question somehow close to my topics in, in the sense that uh, so, uh, somehow we, we the technology that we develop is is more uh, I would say is a more classical so so the classical symbolic AI based on planning and scaring this kind of stuff or ontological reasoning and which is somehow different from the recent trends on machine learning that uh, that they are of course effective but are somehow narrow so they are really on good on really specific task so uh, i mean this is i mean this is the general impression well but if you want to enhance the general more generalize the intelligence of these machines so we it seems that uh, this technology struggle in, in, in doing this so uh, basically the, the point I want to discuss uh, how maybe uh, an integration of more general uh, in, integration of more general and more uh, heterogeneous capabilities that can be implemented with AI and also more classical AI, I would say, can actually uh, be helpful in, in extending this uh, the, the flexibility of rob of robot uh, robot robotic cells or human robot collaboration. Also, for example, I, I, I think uh, with respect to the human factor and something that I mentioned at the, at the, at the end of my of my talk, that is something that we are currently investigating is uh, so the capability of allow systems or controllers to to have more to know better process and, and know better the features of the humans, for example, that uh, of that uh, interact with the with the operator. So know her her skills or her uh, physical capabilities, I would say, so uh, be able to better personalize the interaction when possible, and so better adapt uh, the, the interaction or to re realize a more engaging and more uh, reliable uh, collaboration with the human and the agent. So I would like to know your opinion on this. So maybe I can tell you also. Um, so I had like also a kind of a similar mindset to you, like a few months ago, in terms of that, I think that the integration of the learning components should be kind of modular into a more structured uh, plan. Like, I don't know, we can have a, a, a symbolic a symbolic structure representing the whole plan, but then some modules that represent the perception elements or some primitive movements or something. 
but on the other hand, like with the current successes that we have seen, like in the few months of this DALI and this text to image and everything that is pure end to end, yes, a lot of data. I'm still, I'm still, I'm starting to wonder if actually, like a massive amount of data and training like a, a system that forgets about the structure may succeed in the in few years for also robotics without the need of having this symbolic representation so I don't know like I, I, I was in the mindset of modularity but now I'm doubting seeing the success cases uh, from our point of view my uh, I'll just comment on the first first question uh, what's the main limit? Well, we we saw in the, in the last uh, years uh, that okay, you you may have the the best AI uh, algorithm uh, based on learning or let's say classical uh, symbolic, uh, but when it comes to automate tasks uh, like a human would do, uh, it's it's still uh, uh, really really complex to perform uh, what a Roman a, a human would do uh, when it comes to assembly uh, some small pieces or just to um, I mean not to plan at a symbolic level but to plan at a geometric level and uh, generalize to let's say any type of task and um, I haven't found a let's say out of the box solution in the in the, in the literature uh, but I, I even think we are very far from that. And so when it comes to uh, actually performing some uh, some basic tasks uh, uh, that in manufacturing are actually quite complex, you need to do small movements to uh, do some um, comply to have some compliance between the uh, the robot and the, and the environment. So the, the, the robot the robot should be really aware of what's around it and, uh, and not just plan for symbolic uh, uh, symbolic sequence of, uh, of actions. And um, so I, I think that's one of the main bottlenecks I see from the, let's say from the bottom. Uh, so we are dealing with motion planning, motion control. And from that point of view, uh, I think we are still far from uh, uh, an ultimate solution, let's say. Good. <clears throat> Good. Thanks for your points. That's um, interesting. A bit. It's open question, actually. So uh, I don't know. Maybe we can move to the just the last topic if we have if we have time. Or yes. uh, okay. yeah, let's move to the third one. Okay. So which is about uh, knowledge engineering, and uh, so the effective de the deployment and integration of artificial intelligence and robotics in manufacturing generally requires the contribution of different expertise, as well as the interaction and involvement of different domain experts and or stakeholders. So the question are, uh, do you think that the use of knowledge engineering tools would facilitate the design of industrial AI based robotics uh, applications and increase the quality of the obtained production systems? Which are the limits of current tools and open challenges with respect to the deployment of AI and robotics on concrete production environment? And which are the most critical design choices that would require major communication where knowledge engineering tools would facilitate knowledge sharing? And so just a brief comment from my side. On this aspect, uh, this is another thing that we are investigating and share work give us the opportunity also to investigate this because concerning for example task planning system it is really we have somehow in the middle between uh, production engineers that uh, knows the production line so knows how the production process should be carried out and uh, on the one on the one end and on the other end we have the robotic expert that knows how to control the robot and how uh, it should behave in the actual environment. So when you synthesize a task planning model, actually you have to com make a compromise among these these different requirements. So the production needs and the uh, capability of the robo robotic uh, tools and devices and, and also the capability of the human operator. So 
in this sense, uh, what we want, we'd like to investigate uh, with shell work, but also in the future is uh, the ability to to design, to provide a tool for, for example, production engineers to have a, a way to manually control this aspect of the deployment of the system. So have a way to to manually put their the the expertise and so model they explicitly model the, the the process in the in in a way that is then usable for through task planning so uh, abstracting for the syntactic and formal uh, complexity of the task planning technologies that we want to use but provide a general tool that uh, allows them to easily more or less specify how the production process should be carried out and then autom automatize some of this part reducing yeah, some some extent the risk of mistakes and um, errors in the model that we can synthesize from interactions. So, and so we believe that uh, the development of some tools that facilitate uh, production engineer, engineers, for example, to put their hands on the on the task planning tool and put their expertise in modeling the their their process that they know very well. Is a, it would facilitate the deployment and the perceived usefulness of these technologies in, in also in real, real scenario. And that's from my side, my point of view. Do you have any comment on this? I don't know. Ulen, Marco? Uh, yeah, I'm not uh, an expert of, let's say, knowledge engineering. Uh, um, let's say in the last years working in share work, I kind of uh, started to to see what's uh, what's available in uh, in this field. And yeah, regarding the first question, yeah, I think it uh, it's useful. Uh, it's a um, let's say a systematic approach to in, encode. Uh, knowledge about the the cell, about the shop floor, in uh, in a model that can be used for many purposes. Um, I just like to stress that, uh, as I was saying before, the the real shop floor is uh, is a real complex environment, so it requires uh, a lot of data, uh, also manually inserted. And uh, when it comes to a real shop floor, uh, the process engineer or the production engineer uh, should uh, basically uh, put a lot of data in this uh, in this knowledge representation, and uh, and the system becomes very very very, very complex. And um, so it's not just the cell, it's not just the the single process, but it's how the process is connected to the the shop floor, how the shop floor. Uh, is decomposed and into cells and is part of a factory and um, so yeah complexity is a uh, is a big big issue in, the, in this sense for Masaya, i don't think that i could provide like too much input as to be honest i'm not so familiar with the knowledge engineering I guess I can't too much yet. Okay, I don't know if there is someone from the, from the audience that want to participate. You can still raise the hand if you want. Um, um, I think that uh, we answered all the questions we got. And also, I would like to thank uh, Alessandro and uh, all the speakers for this uh, nice discussion and these three topics that are, you know, a bit more general compared to um, the detailed uh, training session related to motion planning. And um, yes, uh, just uh, to conclude this session, I would like to invite uh, the attendees to our uh, last training session. Uh, that uh, we, the focus will be a bit different from uh, the previous one because it will be mainly dedicated to the industrial implementation of uh, our solution. Uh, it would be the 7th of July uh, at 10 a.m. and will be about uh, collaborative robotics in, in industrial implementation. 
towards more flexible and integrated factories. So we will have different speakers uh, from the industry and also uh, the technical coaches, so the research uh, organization that supported them during, the, um, during these four years will be pre uh, present and supporting the industry in order to give uh, everybody some feedbacks uh, about uh, which could be the future of these uh, developments. So again, thanks a lot to the speakers and thanks also to the attendees for being here for two hours. I hope you enjoy our training session and uh, hope to see you soon, uh, the 7th of July. Bye-bye and thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.